Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us today uh, for this somewhat impromptu uh, webinar regarding managing down corn um, from the August 10th derate show that we had in Iowa. My name is Megan Anderson, and I'm the Central Iowa Field Agronomist for Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, and I want to say thanks for joining us today. Um, we appreciate you supporting our programming, and obviously there's a lot of interest around this subject. Uh, so while people file in, I'm just going to go over a few uh, details that I'll go ahead and I'll put in the chat box as well so that you can read them uh, in case you're not listening to me. Um, so if you have any technology concerns, please put those in the chat box, send them to our panelists, and we'll try to help you navigate those. Um, uh, if you're a CCA uh, who has not given us your CCA number, please go ahead and put that in the chat box as well. Um, at any point during the presentation, if you have any questions for our speakers, there is a Q&A box kind of in the bottom uh, center left of your screen. Uh, if you would like to uh, put those in there, that would help us keep them organized and that way everybody uh, can get their questions answered by our speakers. Um, after this presentation is over, it, it will be recorded and we'll actually archive it online on our Crops Team YouTube page. And I'll give you that link as well in case you'd like to share it with any friends uh, family or colleagues. Um, with that, uh, I would like to turn over uh, the program to our first speaker for the day. So uh, Dr. Matt Dar is going to start us out. Uh, he is a professor in our agricultural and biosystems engineering department. And I like to think of Matt as my uh, expert in all things equipment and tillage related. So uh, Matt, thank you. Uh, for participating in this program, and um, let's get started. Yeah, thanks, Megan. I think, uh, you know, for all of us, we're, we're happy to contribute. I think all of us wish that we, we didn't have to talk about this topic uh, uh, this week, but but certainly there's been, um, you know, a lot of damage around the state and, and uh, a lot of questions coming in about, you know, what some options look like for, uh, uh, for some for tillage management and, and really what to do with, uh, with fields that are um, unharvestable, right? Fields that, that have either been uh, uh, totaled out already uh, by an uh, insurance adjuster or, or maybe on their way uh, to. So uh, what we're going to try to go over today is just some, some options to consider and, uh, and, and uh, hopefully uh, provide some insight into, you know, ideas that will that'll help each of you figure out, you know, what the right strategy is uh, in the fields that, that you're dealing with. Uh, throughout the course of today, myself and the other speakers, I think you're going to hear a lot about, you know, thinking about what your goals are and, and why, you know, you, you might want to do certain things uh, to this unharvestable corn or, or severely down corn. Um, I, I think what, what I'm going to show you as part of the, the tillage management strategies is, is really focused around optionality and, and the options that exist. I, I do think it's important, though, that we kind of take a step back and think about, you know, within our production system, we think about residue management of, of corn generally. Uh, the, the combine is, is really our first pass through the field with, uh, with any residue management or particularly residue sizing. And, and what we're missing, right, the biggest thing that we're missing this year uh, with the lack of a combine going through the field is a lack of a mechanical pass that is uh, size reducing that residue and uh, size reduction is helpful for several reasons. It uh, helps ensure that the, the crop can begin to dry down. Uh, it ensures that we, we can uh, uh, start to get degradation of that material. And it helps us work towards that process of getting towards planting in the following year. And, you know, when you think about what our goals are, right, having that, that uh, you know, with the tough challenges of, of 2020, right, we should be thinking about, you know, what are the practices we can do now uh, to get us uh, into a good head start into uh, what 2021 uh, is. So as we went out through the, uh, through the course of some demonstrations that we're going to talk to you and show you about today, we really focused on several aspects of what those goals might be and how how tillage or residue management can help them. Uh, so things like, you know, reducing the size of the residue, uh, beginning to get that plant to decompose a little bit, uh, accelerating, you know, if we can get some corn to germinate, that's great because every germinated 
seed in the fall is one less volunteer corn plant uh, in the spring. Um, and then you also hear from us today about some topics around, you know, what should we be thinking about in terms of cover crop or, or, you know, how does this fit into your fertility plan, right? These are all things that you have to think about within your, uh, your goals and, and strategy. <laughs> so um, last week, a group of us got together and, uh, and we went out and to try to help to uh, provide some insight, capture some data, capture some video on different ways that we could help deal with and, and begin to take a step forward into the, into the 2021 season. Uh, we went out with five different types of tillage implements. Uh, we started with uh, uh, a vertical till tools, a couple different vertical tillage tools. And when you, when you hear me talk today, I'm really going to talk about two types of vertical tillage. I'm going to talk about a, a low aggressive vertical tillage that uses a, a fairly shallow uh, two to four degree gang angle. Um, and, and that's mostly just going to, going to chop or size reduce stocks. Uh, we also did some trials with high aggressive uh, uh, vertical tillage or closer to a 10 degree gang angle. Um, we found a, uh, a tandem disc we were able to borrow that I think we considered to be very similar to the type of older style discs that are probably sitting around many, uh, uh, many farm sites today, and, and that's included in here. Um, we're also going to talk to you about some, some trials with a, uh, what we call a, a high-speed disc, or some folks refer to it as a, as a European disc because it, it really originated or became popular in the uh, in Europe before coming to, to North America. Uh, and then we did some work with a disc ripper as well. So the, the aero image that's up, you know, shows you some very different types of outcomes, right, that are, that are achieved by each of these tools. And, uh, and we'll get into each of those as we go throughout the course of the, of the uh, presentation here. So to jump right in, I'm gonna talk about the vertical till uh, options at first. Um, as I mentioned, we use gang angle to, to really drive our aggressiveness. Uh, all of the tillage tools that we used, all the vertical tillage tools had either a, a wavy or a notch style blade to them. And there's three different blades that are shown in this photo. Uh, what's important to note is when we, uh, when we cut things, when we, when we cut residue, um, having, you know, waviness to the blade or, or some sort of serration uh, is helpful. And speed is also helpful. And it's no different than trying to cut through something, you know, some hard fruit at your uh, in your kitchen, right? The, the faster you hit it and uh, the sharper, the more serrated that knife is, the easier it's going to uh, cut through the material. So, you know, vertical tillage, which is designed to run in between eight to 12 miles an hour, um, is really a, an, an excellent way to size reduce the material uh, and still min mitigate how much uh, true tillage or, or soil incorporation is, uh, is happening in the field. So I'm going to start, I'm going to play a video and then I've got several pictures too. So if the video doesn't come through very well, don't, uh, don't worry about that. But this is a uh, uh, aggressive gang angle VT tool. So we're running about a uh, 10 degree gang angle here, we're at about 10 miles an hour. And, uh, you know, of course it's, it's flattening whatever corn is, is, uh, is still standing. Um, and, and really here we're focused on the, the chopping action that's happening to that, uh, uh, to that residue. The, uh, this is a look at, at the field um, immediately after that, that machine went through the, the pass. Um, uh, the, the first photo here is our low aggressive setting. So in this case, we're talking about a two to three degree gang angle. And I wanna, I wanna point out a couple things, right? First of all, um, for those of us in the field, we, we felt like after uh, a, a shallow gang angle VT tool went through the field, it looked very similar to what we would expect a field to look like after a combine had gone through the field. Um, we could rarely see the soil. Uh, almost the entire soil surface was still covered with residue. Uh, we did very little mixing or incorporation of the, uh, uh, of the residue, um, but we did chop it, right? It was, it was, uh, uh, Quite a bit of it was, was significantly chopped. Uh, again, for those of us in the field, we felt like if, if you're in a, a situation where no-till no is your normal practice and, and you're trying to, to take a step in the direction to help you implement uh, no-till successfully, uh, this VT tool you know, did, a, did a very nice job of at least size reducing and getting those particles down to a, 
reasonable size that they could be managed uh, effectively with uh, uh, with row cleaners uh, next spring. Went back out a couple days later. Uh, this is four days later, and, and took some more pictures. And and again, I think this really highlights just how how much ground cover is still there. So not much incorporation, but you can see from the particle sizes that we really did do a pretty nice job of chopping uh, chopping up the material. As far as uh, you know, if you're going to go plant a cover crop into this, I think we definitely suggest uh, you know you need to be thinking about a drill or, or something that's going to going to create seed to soil contact. Uh, broadcast spreading would not be a uh, probably a great great solution here. So uh, similarly with the high aggressive VT, as we went from the two degrees to a 10 degree gang angle, uh, we still chop the material uh, nicely, but the biggest difference that you're going to see now is that we've got more uh, soil exposed on the on the soil on the ground surface. And that's because we are starting to do some actual tillage and some some residue incorporation at the more aggressive uh, gang angles. So this was, was a photo from the, uh, the day of. You notice how green the, the stalks and plant material are. And uh, coming back four days later, um, you know, we've got material that, again, looks, uh, looks very similar to the size of particles we would see uh, after harvest. But here you can definitely notice that we are, you know, doing additional incorporation and starting to expose that, that soil surface. Um, I will tell you, you know, walking through the field again after, you know, four days in that low aggressive setting, you know, there was a solid two inch mat of residue. Like you could, you could grab a handful of residue off the top of the surface and, and you weren't touching soil. Um, with, the, with the more aggressive VT angle, um, you know, we were incorporating into the top one to two inches of the, of the soil surface. So while the ground was covered, it certainly wasn't uh, the same thickness or, or mat that existed in the, in the more shallow gang angle VT. Um, and, and we think this would be certainly um, suitable for, um, for no-tilling as, uh, um, as we get into next spring uh, with appropriate row cleaners. The, uh, the next tool that we brought out was, uh, was a tandem disc. And um, I want to I make a few comments here to just to, to level set. The tandem disc that we, we pulled out of the shed was, was literally a machine that does not get used very often. And, and I think our mindset was there's probably a lot of producers that still have tandem discs around that may consider pulling them out. And um, in this case, uh, we did have some notched blades on the front uh, of, of the disc, uh, the front gangs. Um, although they were dull and the smooth discs on the back were fairly worn and, uh, and dull. Um, additionally, this, this uh, tandem disc is, is several years old and would, would be considered what we call more of on the lighter side of discs compared to what you would, you would see on the market today. Um, so we were, we were sub uh, 150 pounds per blade of downforce, which is, which is not real great uh, operating at six miles an hour. So when we start to compare and contrast like, you know, a VT tool with a notched blade or serrated blade at, you know, 10 miles an hour versus a, you know, a worn older, older style um, disc gang um, at 150 pounds of, of downforce and six miles an hour, uh, we just didn't get much cutting action. And uh, in our case, I want to be careful not to say that this was a, uh, um, you know, that all, all, all discs, tandem discs would do this, but, you know, maintenance matters in this case. And if your blades aren't sharp and, and you don't have much weight on the machine, you're going to have a hard time cutting through that, uh, that material. And that was uh, certainly what we witnessed. So I've got a video here. Again, it's it, in, in many ways, this almost acted a bit more like a roller, you know, in terms of it helped roll and flatten, but uh, we were doing very little uh, actual uh, cutting of, of material. Um, so what you're, what you're seeing is that it's, it's crop that's laid down, but, but isn't really effectively chopped. And, and that gets back to what our goals are, right? If our, if our goal is to, is to really um, uh, get back to a similar situation after, that, that would normally occur with, with a, a grain combine, 
um, you know, th this wasn't making the cut. Uh, literally, it wasn't wasn't chopping up material. Um, we did come back and and run the same area in the opposite direction. Made a couple passes over it, and and uh, you know, if we hit it enough times, we could start to start to get some soil incorporation, start to get some some uh, some residue breakdown and some chopping. But um, it was certainly not as effective as some of the more uh, other tools that were, you know, uh, frankly, just hitting it with sharper blades at higher speeds. The uh, next next option we're going to talk about is, uh, is, a, is what I call a European high-speed disc, or you'll, you'll often see it called a high-speed disc here in the U.S. now. Um, these tools have been around for a couple decades, uh, but it's only been sort of less than 10 years that they've made a mark here in the, uh, in the U.S., and they started up up in uh, Canada and in the Dakotas, and, they, and they've kind of made their way down into the uh, um, the, the Midwestern marketplace. Uh, the photo that's up here is a stock photo, but it, it helps to highlight if you're not familiar with these machines, what they what they are and what they look like. Um, and so what you'll notice is there's there's two sets of, of two gangs of, of blades right on this uh, machine, but they're really pretty close together and. Uh, that is something to, to note or you know, we were a little concerned about, you know, given the amount of residue we were moving, whether we might uh, plug uh, these machines um, uh, because of the, the close proximity of those blades. The uh, particular machine that we ran in the trial used um, 20 inch notched blades on both the front and the rear. So the photo here shows smooth blades. The one we ran had notched blades. And again, those notched blades are going to act as a you know another type of serration, and they're going they're going to help to cut that material better. Um, that that tandem disc was around 100, 150 pounds per blade of, of force or, or weight, and on these machines we're talking about 300 pounds of of, uh, of force per blade. So you know, there's just a lot more pressure on these, a lot more capacity to to, to cut and slice that material. Uh, and then speed; these are operating at 10 miles an hour, so so the speed's also helping us to to size reduce and, and chop down that material. All right, here's a video of that uh, particular machine in action. And um, again, we're, we're pulling it at about uh, 10 miles an hour. This is, you know, this, this, takes, uh, this takes some horsepower, right? You're typically gonna see these machines on, on large uh, and, um, you know, up and upwards of the, uh, you know, mid 500, 600 horsepower range. They're they're they can be they can be a bit power hungry. I think this is a uh, this this photo we took from the the drone. I think really highlights some of the differences and back to what our goals are right in the field. Um, when that VT tool was running in the video I showed earlier, you know, you didn't see a dust cloud off the back end of the VT because it really wasn't wasn't working the soil much at all. Um, in, in this case, you know, we, we are at, we're doing quite a bit more tillage with, uh, uh, with a high speed disc. And, uh, and as a result, we are kicking up a lot more dirt and, and you can just tell the differences in terms of the visual ground cover between the, the, uh, uh, you know, the low aggressive VT, which is that strip over on the left versus the, uh, the high speed disc, uh, on the right. Some more photos of this is the day we were in the field, right? And again, um, you know, comparing it, you know, comparing it to the, you know, the low aggressive VT, which left almost everything on the soil surface, but chopped it, and then the more aggressive VT chopped it and buried part of it. The high speed disc that's definitely buried more material. We got more residue incorporation. We got more, you know, ears uh, in the in the soil or touching the ground. Um, I think uh, from, uh, from those of us in the field, though, I think our perspective was that it probably it didn't do as good of a job of chopping material as the VT tool did. And, and I think we'd sort of expect that based on, you know, blade spacing and blade design. Um, so, you know, between the, the high speed disc and the VT, that was sort of your trade off, right? The, the high speed disc would give you a little bit more soil incorporation, but, you know, you had some stocks that were still a little bit long. And, uh, on the VT side, it was it was chopping material really well, um, but you weren't you weren't always getting a lot of that incorporated into the uh, into the soil. And then we came back uh, again four days later to take a look at how how's it weathering down, and 
again, very dry and, and, you know, you can look across that picture and see that, you know, we see a lot of, uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, exposed soil because we're doing a, a decent job here of, of incorporating that residue and, uh, and getting it mixed in. Um, and, uh, and, and definitely, you know, it is it's certainly more aggressive than what you're getting with a, with a vertical tillage tool. And the, uh, the last one I'll show is a, uh, we call the modified high speed ripper. And, you know, I, I'll say modified because we, we knew this wasn't going to work, but we did have to shoot a video to prove that if you take a disc ripper into the field, you will, <laughs> you will capture a whole lot of big plug of material. Um, and that's, that's absolutely the case. You can't, we can't take a, a disc ripper. We can't take a V ripper, anything that's got long shanks. Uh, we simply can't take into these kind of field conditions where we have uh, full length corn plants uh, out in the field. And so what we, uh, what we did is we, we simply removed the, uh, um, we simply removed the, the ripper shanks from the tool and still relied on the, you know, basically used it as a really heavy disc, right? We, we relied on the weight, we relied on the, the large uh, 26 inch discs on the front with their broad spacing in order to, uh, uh, to help improve um, you know, residue incorporation and, and do what we can on, on chopping up material. Um, once, we, uh, once we did that, once we, we took the ripper, um, ripper shanks off, it, it really flowed residue quite well. Um, we were operating at about, uh, you know, six to eight miles an hour. Um, you know, of course, since you're not dragging those, those big shanks to the field, you can, you can go a little bit, um, a little bit faster, but, you know, for folks that have uh, combination rippers or, you know, a, a disc ripper disc um, combinations, this is a, an option to simply, you know, remove those, those uh, ripper shanks and, and, um, and, and do, and, get this material you know broken down and, and incorporated in, in that way. Now these uh, these tools are um, are going to be more aggressive, right? I mean they're they're designed to be uh, fairly aggressive in, in corn residue and we certainly saw that. Uh, it took some time to to kind of tune in the the closing discs and the and the uh, rolling basket in the back to leave you know somewhat of a of a level surface. Um, and, and it's not, it doesn't look quite as aggressive as, um, you know, as if, if you're running traditionally behind a corn head, but there was a, a whole lot of mixing going on, right? We were putting a lot of, a lot of biomass below the soil surface and um, um, getting that, getting that material mixed. Um, I, I think I will say that from a, a size reduction perspective, because the, the disc blades on these tools are are designed to be wider apart because they're they're mixing more than chopping. Um, you know, in this case, we, we didn't size reduce material that well. We still had a lot of corn stalk, a lot of pieces of stock that were, you know, 18, 24 inches long. Um, you know, because of the spacing of the of the discs, and that's that's a, a just to be expected when you compare you know an 18 inch wide disc spacing to you know a VT tool that has a disc every uh, you know every five inches. Here's a look at the same similar spot in the field, you know, coming back a few days later and, and again, it looks pretty, uh, you know, pretty, uh, pretty incorporated. And, and, and if you're used to looking at, you know, a disc ripper field after, after corn stalks, this is, this is going to look, uh, looks, look fairly similar to that. Uh, definitely would need a uh, smoothed over in the spring. I don't think, I think it was, I think we, we felt like it was going to be pretty rough to no-till directly into, to that crop material. And, and uh, it's going to take a spring pass to, to level it up. Um, so I'm going to wrap up here with just a couple overview pictures, and and you know I want to go back to the the first slide and the first comments I made about it. Really is is uh, you know the, what you do in this situation is going to be driv driven by what your goals are, and uh, I think we we uh, we were able to, to demonstrate or or to document that you know, we could really control what the outcome was, right? If we're after an environment where we're just trying to size residue without, uh, without really doing a lot of incorporation, you know, I, I, we, we all felt like a, a VT tool could, could do that. Um, if our production practice, right, was um, uh, relied on or, or, or performs well with, uh, with additional residue incorporation, then, 
and a little bit more soul mixing, um, we could achieve those too, right? With either the high speed disc or the uh, you know, modified uh, combination ripper, combination disc ripper, um, you know, just based on what those uh, what those needs are. And the last photo is, is kind of an aerial shot, just to kind of show you the different uh, you know different patterns across the field. And again, what you're really seeing here in terms of the dark versus the light is the amount of uh, um, uh, amount of soil that's exposed, and it gives you a great idea of the amount of mixing and and, uh, and residue incorporation that happen, um, along with the, with the size reduction. Um, you will notice, I mean, this is, uh, it's unique, unique, unique condition. There are some spaces like in this high aggressive VT in the middle, you'll notice it looks like it's a little bit striped through some of these areas. And, and uh, some of that was, was us learning how to, to dial that tool in uh, and not, not bounce across the field because of, of how rough and aggressive the, uh, well, just how much biomass, of course, was out in the field. Um, so just like with any tillage or planting practice, it's, it's smart to make sure you're getting out of the machine and taking a look at what the result is and, and making adjustments as, uh, uh, as you see fit. So um, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end there and I'm going to pass it off back to, uh, uh, back to the, the next speaker, pass it to Megan to hand off the next speaker and, and we'll, uh, we'll capture all the questions here when we get, get to the end. All right, thank you, Matt. Uh, we've had a ton of questions come in. Um, so the first question, while we're switching over to Mark, that I figured I could just address, uh, because I did see some people have joined by phone, just to make sure that they get to see the answer to that too, uh, was the question uh, regarding what direction we were traveling with the implements in comparison to how the corn was laying. Um, so I think this picture, is this actually looking north? Yeah, this is looking north, yeah. Yeah, so we were running north-south with all these implements, um, and the corn, of course, was laid from the west to the east, so we were running perpendicular to that. Yeah, and the, the key point there is that, particularly with anything that has a disc, if you run in the direction it's laying, you have the chance for that entire stock to simply pass through or between a set of the discs. So you, you definitely want to hit it at uh, at least a fairly aggressive angle, if not perpendicular, to really help with with size reduction. If, if your goal is to size reduce, then the more, the more closer you are to perpendicular, the, the better job you will in, in chopping or sizing that residue. Definitely, I think that's a great point. So we do have some more questions, but we will move on to Mark and then we'll address all the questions in a big bunch at the end. So if everybody can just kind of hang on uh, for, for some of those. Um, but we are gonna move on to Dr. Mark Licht. He is a cropping systems uh, agronomist and uh, extension specialist with Iowa State University. And he is on campus. And uh, Mark is going to provide us some agronomic uh, considerations as we look at this fall. And I, I think maybe at this point in the season, it's a little bit easier and more palatable to start thinking about uh, next year and, and what the crop might bring us next year. So Mark's gonna give us some considerations that we need to be thinking about for this fall and next spring. So uh, I, I do want to first thank uh, Matt Dar and his crew. They did a fantastic job of setting up something on very, very short uh, time frame and turnaround time. Um, so that really, I, I think, does help us as we think through, um, you know, what we're going to do this fall on those unharvested acres. So, um, and, and Matt mentioned this as well, but it, it, this is not a one-size-fits-all situation. Um, we obviously have some areas of the state that, that are in more drought than others. And, and obviously some of that area um, that's in the drought um, D2, D3 category also had some of the uh, high wind uh, and, and damage from that. And so that's gonna change things a little bit. Um, the goals are also gonna be changing a little bit on how we look at this. So if we're looking to get cover crops established, if we're looking at residue decomposition, um, how we're thinking about um, uh, managing for volunteer corn or if, if that's even a consideration and then I think all ultimately most people are thinking to some degree um, what does that seedbed preparation look like and, and how do we get there uh, type thing and so I'm going to address some of these things um, uh, as we go forward here I'm going to actually start um, with cover crops um, because I, I think then that'll dovetail into um, some of the, the field management and considerations as we look at how to, to, to process some of that residue. So if, if this corn was 
you know, just lodged, um, I think we can get by with an aerial or broadcast seeding because um, it's, it's very likely that it's going to reach the soil surface. Um, whereas if it's broken or pinched um, with those stalks or, or very, very severely lodged um, where they're laying uh, horizontally, um, that aerial or broadcast seeding, that seed's going to get caught up in that canopy a little bit. And so we got to be careful of that. Um, additionally, in that situation, we have very low amount of uh, light penetration to, to get that emergence uh, going there. So those, those were just a couple of thoughts, but then um, as, as Matt and I um, were talking last week when we did that, that tillage demo, um, there's other considerations that come into play when we think about how we're gonna process that residue um, and what that means for uh, cover crop seeding. And so I'll, I'll, I'll touch on some of those things as well. Um, and then an, another consideration is really how do we look at uh, the, the timing and method of this seeding and, and considering that most of the state is at, at very least abnormally dry, right? Um, so if we, if we want to seed a cover crop, we're gonna have to make sure that it, get, it gets seeded and then there's a, a rainfall afterwards um, in order to get some moisture. Um, seed to soil contact will also help with that germination and emergence uh, too. And, and we can think about that as we go through and, and move into some of the, the tillage or the, the residue processing aspects of this. So just a, a couple pictures uh, for reference. Um, the, the low aggressive VT is there on the left hand side and the higher aggressive VT uh, picture is on the right hand side. Um, like Matt said, um, you know, you, you look at that low aggressive VT and, and it really does look very similar to um, what it might look like, you know, after a combine is ran through the field um, with the addition of a, a lot of corn ears and, and corn on the ground there. Um, so when we look at, look at that and we kind of think about what, what are we really looking at or what are we hoping to get from uh, either of these, um, I think with both of these, um, it would be very easy to come in and uh, drill seed a cover crop into that. Uh, we could also do an aerial or broadcast seeding um, with that. Um, on the low aggressive VT, if we do an aerial or broadcast seeding, we may have to come back in uh, across it with that low aggressive VT just to kind of uh, work it in, uh, get a little bit more uh, seed to soil contact with it. Uh, but again, in, in either of these situations, um, I think we can get a cover crop established. Um, and I don't, I, I really don't think either of these would require additional tillage in the spring before planting. So if you were looking at a high residue uh, situation or uh, even if you were a no-tiller and were maybe trying to, or not necessarily required to uh, be no-till, you could use that low aggressive VT, um, which had very little to no um, disturbance of the soil um, and, and still maintain that system to some degree. Um, when I look at and, and I think about our, our disking and, and so Matt already described some of what we were looking at with the tandem disk there on the left hand side versus the, um, the high speed disk on the right hand side. Um, both of these again are, are relatively smooth. Um, with I think, I think with both of these two situations, uh, we could very easily have aerial seeded or broadcast seeded ahead of that field operation to get a, a cover crop to establish. There was enough soil mixing there um, that it would it would establish fairly well. Um, and then after seeing the the four day uh, pictures, um, a lot of that residue, the leaf tissue in particular, um, does dry up, and so we're getting much more um, sunlight penetration down in onto that uh, soil and, and the canopy. Um, is much more open, right, uh, to get that germination and emergence. Um, I think with both of these situations, again, um, while I think the discs maybe did not size that residue as well, um, with proper setup of the planter, you could go and, and plant right into this. Um, and, and from a cover crop perspective, then you wouldn't necessarily have to have that uh, um, cover crop terminated by uh, some sort of a tillage ahead of planting. You could you could really terminate it and go forward from there. Um, but again, I, I think it's really gonna take um, making sure that the row cleaners are set up um, to, to move that residue out of that row. Um, so that way it's not pinching um, as, you, as you go forward with that planting operation. 
so with the disc ripper, um, yeah, so um, originally um, what I had on this slide was disc ripper is probably a non-option. Um, and I, I think it, it's definitely a non-option if you keep the shanks on. Um, but I think if you take those shanks off and you get things adjusted right, um, it's, it is sizing the residue fairly nicely. They, there are some larger pieces there. Um, but it's definitely too rough um, to, to plant into, as, as Matt had indicated. And so um, from a cover crop option standpoint here, um, we, we sit back and we say, um, yeah, we can get a cover crop seeded this fall. Um, we could probably uh, aerial seed and broadcast seed fairly effectively here. Drill seeding, uh, we may have to level it off even before we ran a drill across it, um, although some drills would be able to handle it. Um, but planting uh, the next crop into it in the spring is, is probably going to be a little bit more challenging. So I'm going to take a, a step back because I focus mostly on on the cover crops aspects as we went through those. But if I go back and I kind of think about um, the residue decomposition aspect of it, um, you know, what we're really doing is we're looking at trying to size up that residue, um, getting it in closer contact with the soil. The all, and I think all of the, the systems, you know, do a fairly good job at it from that perspective. Um, the issue that we're gonna have um, with residue decomposition is um, that is driven largely by temperature and moisture. Um, temperature is not a problem um, at this point in the, in the growing season, uh, but moisture definitely is. Um, so if we don't get rainfall, um, that's going to slow down the decomposition process for us. Um, having said that, um, we do have a little bit more time frame for decomposition to occur here this fall just because of, of the time of when all this is occurring. Uh, we've probably gained two to three, uh, maybe even four weeks um, from that perspective. Um, and, you know, that extra time, um, one thing that also helps with decomposition is uh, ultraviolet light. And so we, as long as we have sunlight out there, um, that can help us uh, with that decomposition process a little bit as well. So, um, and then Megan asked me and um, asked me to maybe provide a few insights on what I've termed how much to fertilize and, and that maybe um, not much, uh, depending on, on how things have went. And so um, if you're going through normal corn grain or silage harvest, you know, it's really a business as usual type of mentality, um, keeping in, taking into account, you know, what your soil tests are, um, soil fertility levels are, what expected um, yield levels are, and then uh, put that fertility on uh, accordingly. Um, especially if you were um, already working in a, a two-year um, application method where soybeans was going to be um, applied or planted next year, you probably don't have to change it in that situation. Now where we have a lot of the broken and pinched stalks um, and non-harvestable stalks, um, the nitrogen and, and potassium uptake is about 90%, or at least that's what I'm guessing, because I think a lot of that crop was in the late dough, early dent uh, stage. The phosphorus uptake was already about 70 to 80%. And so, um, while yes, the, the plant uptake was slightly less, um, all that plant material, um, if it's not harvestable and we're, we're talking about processing that and leaving it in the field, all those nutrients are going to recycle back into the soil. Um, and so from a fertility standpoint, um, again, it, a lot of that's going to be back in the soil. The nitrogen and phosphorus, or excuse me, nitrogen and potassium um, do leach out of that plant material fairly well. Um, the nitrogen, um, as far as the grain protein, um, that does have to mineralize a little bit, um, and so that could take just a little bit longer. Um, but again, um, where I'm headed in, in another slide is that we're likely looking at or needing to move these acres uh, into soybeans next year, and so that nitrogen component is not nearly as important from a fertility standpoint next spring. Um, I will, at the at, after I get done um, sharing my screen here, I will um, put in the chat box a ICM article that uh, John Sawyer and Antonio Malarino wrote up um, talking about some of these fertility issues um, and some things to consider there uh, where you can get quite a bit more information than, than I have here on this, this single slide. 
Um, so I say, you know, on these acres that are not going to be harvested uh, for grain this year, um, I really think that we have to switch and move that into soybeans. Um, I, I say that because one, soybeans can tolerate corn residue a lot better um, than, than you can if you were going back in it with corn. Um, that does give us more time for decomposition of that residue material in the spring, more time for residue de or more time for cover crop growth in the spring, and then um, it can help us with controlling that volunteer corn. And, and I'm not going to go much deeper on the volunteer corn side of that because Prashant's up next and, and he can definitely go much deeper than I, than I can. But I think those, th there is a lot of benefit here by moving into a, a soybean system, um, using those cover crops um, to help us suppress some of the early uh, germination and emergence of uh, the volunteer corn, but then um, knowing that we need to to be paying attention to after the soybeans are up and that cover crop is, is terminated. Um, that, that definitely will help us as, as we think through this. So with that, um, I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, we'll transition um, back to Megan and, uh, and on to Prashant. All right, thank you, Mark. Again, we've had a lot of really good questions coming in and uh, some of them we're kind of answering in those in Q and A boxes. Uh, but we'll continue to address those at the end and I'll make sure to highlight some of them since I can tell that we have a few people who have joined by phone. Uh, but we'll move on and we'll kind of get right into uh, volunteer corn management because I think that is, is one of the biggest things that we'll be thinking about as we head into uh, choosing crop rotation for next spring. And so today we have with us uh, Dr. Prashant Jha. He's an associate professor at Iowa State and an extension weed specialist, and he's relatively new still. I don't know how long he gets to hold the relatively new title, but I'm gonna, I'll, I'll keep going with that for now. Uh, so Prashant, thank you for joining us, and thanks for uh, sharing some information with us today. Thanks, Megan. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I will probably take that relatively new, yeah. So, so today, uh, I think that those two were pretty good, uh, pretty good overview of what, from a management standpoint, we can do. Uh, can you hear me, Megan? We can hear you. So I think, uh, uh, and, and just to be redundant over this is, uh, is we kind of like have an idea of what we want to do this fall to manage or to size the residue. And I think uh, pretty excellent information by Matt and Mark. Uh, but moving forward to the next year, I think one of the major challenges that we will be having is, is to deal with this, all this volunteer corn that will be uh, coming up in the next year with its corn and soybean. So uh, just an overview of uh, here, uh, I think like uh, this volunteer corn with all the amount of uh, uh, corn ears and kernels that that will be in contact with the soil and that's in the ground. W w what kind of tillage equipment you are using? Uh, that uh, we probably uh, it will be probably a, a serious concern next year that we have to deal with. So just an introduction here: five thousand plants of uh, on an acre is is probably. Uh, you can say like one one volunteer corn over uh, every three and a half feet of row, and one percent of the corn seed uh, that will be there in those downed corn fields. I think it has been uh, it, it will result in more than hundred thousand volunteer corn plants per acre. So so we got to be uh, taking it a little more seriously and how, and be more proactive in terms of how we are going to manage this massive amount of volunteer corn that may potentially emerge in the following year. So volunteer corn density is based on the research done at University of Minnesota, uh, Nebraska, Lincoln, and South Dakota State, uh, up to like 13,000 plants per acre, which, which we can expect next year. Uh, it, is, it, is, it can cause yield reductions up to more than 50% in soybeans. Definitely corn is a little more competitive uh, so, uh, but a uh, lot of lot of yield reductions, and as you can uh, as you can imagine, in soybeans with the amount of volunteer corn that can potentially emerge. 
Uh, other than that, with the uh, with the residues that we and the pictures that you saw, we may expect a lot of these clumps of volunteer corn plants that uh, that potentially the data suggest that the yield reductions can be even more because of those uh, clumps of volunteer corn plants. Uh, excellent picture taken by Megan on the left. You see, uh, you can imagine the clump. You can see that corn uh, ear right there. Uh, what I was talking about. So as I said, like we got to be more proactive in terms of how we're going to manage this problem, especially for the next year, because it is not going to be a regular uh, harvest loss, but it is, it is a situation where we definitely need to be more proactive. So I will start basically uh, from a fall uh, management options. Uh, um, uh, Matt and uh, uh, Mark, they, they, they talked about different options for for tillage, vertical tillage, how aggressive you can go depending on what kind of situation you want uh, it to be, whether it's a, 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 a tillage situation uh, or, or you want to go to a rather more residue no-till situation, uh, depending on how aggressive you, uh, uh, you, uh, you will be going this fall with your, uh, with your tillage, vertical tillage or disking or with the disk ripper. So with any kind of tillage operations, uh, uh, we will be basically enhancing the soil seed contact and, and basically with if somebody is going to use that uh, uh, use that uh, disc ripper as we saw with Matt, Matt's presentation. I think uh, there will be a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, we, we might expect that there will be some fall germination of those corn seeds which are uh, because of the greatest uh, soil seed contact and uh, some of uh, I think this during this month of September uh, the, the conditions are pretty conducive the uh, warm temperatures and we do have a, a pretty good moisture now that some of these volunteers will come out. So we definitely want those volunteers to come out more. We want to create an environment uh, with uh, any of your tillage practices that we, uh, that we can enhance the germination, the fall germination of, of those uh, volunteer seeds so that uh, one possible mechanism uh, or method to mitigate uh, that you will see less volunteers corn in the next year. Of course, in a no-till high residue situation, as we saw in some of the pictures, with less aggressive till, vertical tillage, I think the, uh, uh, there, there will be less soil seed contact. The seeds which align on the soil surface, uh, as you would imagine here in this picture on the left, uh, they are less likely to germinate now and also in the spring because uh, of the lack of soil seed contact. And again, they would be subjected to decay and predation. So ultimately, uh, I, I would not recommend any additional tillage other than what you are doing with regards to managing your residue uh, at this point in the fall. Coming back to the next year where, where we really need to, to decide what we, uh, what we want to go and, and uh, whether we want to go uh, from, from corn to corn or we want to go from corn to soybean. And, and Mark uh, just was, was on, on the point he, he, uh, that, yes, we definitely need to go to the soybeans next year because just from Ma from a management standpoint, you got more options uh, with the grass herbicides, with one herbicides uh, to control volunteer corn and soybean as compared to corn. So that's that's kind of like a no-brainer. So definitely more advantage to go to uh, to go to soybeans in those fields. And I'm I'm going to uh, come to some of the details on on those. So starting next spring. Uh, I think our uh, weed management program, volunteer corn management program, is going uh, is uh, will be pretty uh, uh, crucial because really we don't want to deal with a lot of volunteers in the crop. I mean, from a crop competition standpoint, from, we may get delayed because of the weather conditions. It is raining; we cannot apply any of the grass herbicide in selector or or, or, or any other grass herbicide. Hey, Prashant, we are having some trouble with your sound. It sounds really good and then it gets really quiet. So could you try to just make sure that it stays still and so that we can hear it as best as possible? Yeah. Okay, that's a lot better. Okay. So uh, can, uh, so, so, sorry about that sound. I think it is just the internet connection. So definitely, uh, uh, I would say like whether uh, we want to go with the pre-plant option of, of, uh, of uh, Gramaxone, which is Paraquet to control majority of the volunteers, which could be Roundup Radio Liberty Link uh, before planting soybeans could be an option. 
Uh, I think uh, a shallow spring tillage or cultivation so that uh, some of the growers may be, may be liking that, but again, there are pros and, and cons to that. We are going to kill emerged corn volunteers before planting uh, soybean, but at the same time, we are going to move some of the corn seeds, which, which are on the soil surface, a uh, little deeper so that, and then uh, those volunteer corn uh, seedlings will, will, will come later in the season. So we, we may have more management issues there. So uh, uh, one of the options which we, you might consider is uh, with the objective that we don't have to deal with volunteer corn uh, in, during, the, uh, during the cropping season is, is, is maybe delay the soybean planting so that we can exhaust the seed bank. Whatever comes, uh, we can kill those with any non-selective herbicide like uh, Gramaxone, whether it's a Roundup Ready or Liberty Link uh, volunteer corn or with tillage. In uh, volunteer corn control in soybean, uh, these are the, some of the standard products uh, we are pretty aware of. Uh, Select Max, uh, again, Assure 2, Fusillade, and again, uh, the, I have provided the rates here. Uh, we will have an ICM blog artic article also where you can see the rates also of these products. Uh, very, very important uh, consideration will be uh, that we are hitting the volunteer corn when it is less than maybe at the 12 inches or less than 12 inches in height. If we are going to let the volunteer corn, because it is going to come up in multiple flushes, most likely. So we definitely need to, uh, need to be more proactive on this that, uh, and be ready to hit that volunteer corn multiple times during the growing season. At least two times, I would say we have to. And it is pretty crucial that we got to, uh, uh, we, we reduce the early season weed competition by spraying those at the right height, less than less than 12 inches and adding some of these adjuvants, of course, like non-ionic surfactant or crop wall or MSO uh, will help in enhancing the activity. In case we are getting delayed and the, and the volunteer corn is more than, more than a foot tall. So one of the questions that uh, came through, uh, is, is, is my voice now clear, Megan? Uh, can you make a comment or should I move? Yep. Yep, your voice is clear. Okay. So I think one of the questions that came up was uh, what kind of uh, what kind of traits we should go with, and can we use some of these traits and associated herbicide associated with those traits to to control uh, volunteers uh, in the subsequent crop? So if your corn was Roundup Ready, which uh, uh, or a conventional corn, of course, yes. The answer is. You can go to a Liberty Link or you can go to a stacked Roundup Ready plus Liberty Link soybean in 2021 next year, or you can go to an Enlist E3 soybean because in all these three situations with the Liberty, uh, you can use Liberty, uh, which is pretty effective for controlling volunteer corn. But again, if you're uh, last year, you got Roundup Ready plus Liberty Link corn, uh, you probably do, uh, do not have any option other than using one of the grass herbicides that I mentioned in my previous slide. Similarly, for any volunteer corn that you have in, in your Roundup Ready extend beans or soybeans, and I, we don't know whether we have, will have these that came by extend beans in the next year, uh, you, you would be, uh, your option would be just grass herbicides definitely there. So again, to, to be honest with you, I would, I would definitely have uh, have this grass use of these grass herbicides like Select Max or Assure 2 as, as my major tool to manage volunteer corn in, in irrespective of the what trade you are going to in, in the soybean. And that's, that's the beauty of going from corn to soybean. It gives you uh, more flexibility and more options. Again, controlling volunteer corn in corn, uh, to be honest with you, a herbicide uh, resistant trade is your only option. Uh, most of the corn trade uh, uh, is not coming alone as a Roundup Ready, but I, uh, I think it is more Roundup Ready plus Liberty Link uh, hybrid. And uh, we, in, in that situation, we have only one option, which is the Enlist corn. Enlist corn, uh, again, because Liberty you cannot use because you, you had Liberty Link corn last year. So Liberty Link uh, corn again is uh, even stacked with Roundup is not an option, uh, definitely. Yeah, so your only option in that case, if you have to go to corn, 
is to is to go with analyst corn, which is a new trade with stacked resistance to 24D, uh, glyphosate, and a FAPR grass herbicide. And the only grass herbicide that is currently labeled in analyst corn is, is Assure 2, okay, which is Quizella FAP. Assure 2, 5 to 12 ounces on an acre for selective control of Roundup Ready plus Liberty Link volunteer corn. So that's, that's the only option you have uh, if you want to come back to corn after corn. So uh, definitely, uh, um, how much of this enlist corn is going to be available next year? Uh, uh, I mean, I think that's a good question. It is commercial. It has been commercialized back in 2018. But how much is, is going to be available as compared to the E3 beans? I don't know. I think uh, we will see more of the E3 beans next year. And how much of that uh, is going to be enlist corn? We definitely uh, don't uh, don't know about that. And I think uh, more push is for, for the E3 beans as compared to uh, enlist corn. There could be one potential problem that we might face, and that is uh, some of the possible antagonism of these grass herbicides, like uh, whether you are using Select as Glethodim or Assure 2 as Quizalafab, with some of the broadleaf products. Uh, uh, and uh, this, is, this is just an example from the literature uh, from where a study was done uh, with, uh, in DT soybean, where uh, they had this uh, Sure, do and, and uh, select applied with the Kemba. Uh, again, those uh, select was applied alone at three different rates low, medium, and high. Uh, with, and then again, the uh, low, medium, and high with the Kemba. And similarly, uh, Quizala FOP, which is the uh, which is sure to applied alone at low, medium, and high rate with and without the Kemba uh, with all those rates. So, uh, as you can see on the right hand side, all, everything looks green, pretty good control with select and Assure two for for volunteer corn, but when you're tank mixing with, with that came by with the broadleaf product, uh, and it could be any other broadleaf product, maybe two four D, but you will see some level of antagonism there, and that's what uh, we are seeing here at the low rate uh, uh, of uh, select with the came by as indicated by this red line here, and also with Quizalafab, we are seeing that there is a decrease in the efficacy. Uh, of that grass herbicide on volunteer corn four weeks after application. However, when you are bumping up the rate of the grass herbicide, basically you are seeing that again, yes, it is giving us a pretty good control of the volunteer corn. So that's the that's the mitigation strategy to avoid that antagonism. So you got to apply a higher rate of the grass herbicide. So if you select max level, say six to twelve ounces. Uh, uh, or on an acre, uh, maybe when you are tank mixing with any broadleaf herbicide product, you probably got to go to a higher rate, maybe from six to from six to twelve ounces, or maybe to nine ounces instead of six ounces, to avoid that possible antagonism. One of the other ways to avoid the antagonism would be uh, yeah, apply the 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 grass herbicide select max or sure to one or uh, one or more days before, or you can do even seven days after the application of that broadleaf product. Uh, generally, uh, some of the research that with some of the adjuvants that uh, people were thinking like, can we overcome this antagonism uh, of a grass herbicide on a grass, uh, grassy weeds or on volunteer corn by adding some adjuvants? And the answer is no, um, for, except for ammonium sulfate. But of course, with the extended max or engineer products, we know that, uh, that, that AMS or ammonium, ammonium sulfate is not an option. So with that, I'd like to entertain any questions if you have. Uh, let me... All right, so first of all, we are approaching the two o'clock hour. So I understand if anybody has to jump off, but I just want to remind everybody that this presentation will go up online um, on our Crops Team YouTube page, which you can find on YouTube by searching um, like Iowa State Crops Team uh, or via the link that I put in at the chat at the beginning. And then just for anybody who's joining via phone, we will put up a transcript of all the Q&A um, responses that we are kind of answering uh, just in by typing answers in just so that everybody can see those. And so to start with, we talked about kind of management of, for this fall and management for next spring. And I think we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but we had a good question at the beginning, which was, you know, how mature does corn have to be in order to be a volunteer corn problem? Uh, do, and kind of uh, 
do we know whether all of this corn is actually going to germinate or not? And so I think maybe Mark uh, might be able to help address this question to start with. Yeah, so so this is a, a really good question because we're we're talking about a lot of kernels out there. As, as you've seen, I, I put an estimate out there in the, the chat box of how many kernels we could be looking at, right? Um, and so shortly after this event, I did um, talk with our seed physiologist across the street in the, the Seed Science Center. And her response was that corn, once it gets into the dough stage, that embryo in the seed kernel is viable. Um, now she did go on and say that that seed has to dry down properly um, or naturally um, in order to be able to, to continue to be viable. Um, and then obviously as we've kind of talked um, from the grain quality side of this is that if we have low test weight corn, um, the storability is not as good either, right? And and so part of that storability also transfers into the field, right? So if we have low test weight corn that's sitting on the ground in the field, it's not going to hold up as well as a, as a high test weight uh, kernel would too. Um, so, you know, yeah, we can talk about how many kernels are viable or, or what stage they're viable, but I think regardless of what that is, is we were looking at, you know, in a lot of cases, you know, we had some good yield potential out there still. Um, but, you know, obviously if we're not harvesting it, um, all of that seed is still out there. And so even if we think of a very small percentage of that, even if it's that 1%, um, you know, we're still looking at a couple hundred thousand kernels per acre. Um, and that that's going to be a tremendous amount to deal with. Um, you know, and so I, I think what Prashant was talking about, you know, as far as planning ahead to manage volunteer corn is where we probably need to be thinking. All excellent points. Okay, so I, I know we addressed tillage. We've talked about sizing residue and managing residue. Um, and so I was wondering if uh, Matt and Mark, what if somebody wants to go to you know, they're a, a diehard no-tiller, right? We don't do any tillage on these fields. And now they have down corn that, you know, those corn stalks may be six to eight foot long uh, that they're going to be uh, dealing with and trying to plant through. Is this a possibility? And what things do they need to be keeping in mind as far as um, planting into that kind of residue next year? Oh, Matt, you're muted. Sorry. Um, you know, if you're a no-teller, right, I think you still have to be thinking about um, residue size, how you're going to deal with residue size, and, and um, you know, you could, you could go through with a stock shop or a rotary mower, or there's other ways you could, you know, you could help to reduce that stock, uh, stock size. Uh, over winter, these stocks are going to become more brittle, right, they're going to start to break down naturally. Um, the challenge you're going to have is that if you hit, uh, if you hit a 36 inch long stock with a row cleaner, um, it, it's going to, you're going to have a lot more chances to plug or hairpin at that row unit because the particle size is too big to just sweep out of the way like we would normally like to with a, with a row cleaner. Um, some row tillage, right, like a, a, a single disc opener or a, a fluted opener on the front, you know, of your, of your planter might, might help as well. Um, but yeah, I do think, you know, <clears throat> you know, if you're in a no-till situation, you still need to have put some thought into, can I do something this fall that's going to size reduce material, at least similar to what my combine head would normally do. So the, the only thing I would add to that is, um, if you're underneath a conservation plan and that conservation plan requires you to be no-till, um, you probably need to go talk to your um, NRCS office um, because they would consider even at, at this point in time, anyhow, they're still considering even the low aggressive VT, which had very little, if any, um, soil disturbance, they still consider that a tillage operation. Okay, so while yes, that would be, a, I would say that if you're not required to, you know, by a conservation plan, if you're not required to be, uh, you know, a, a to do that, you, you could come through with that vertical tillage to help size some things up. But again, if you're if you have the requirement from a conservation plan standpoint, um, go talk to your NRCS office. 
All right, great points. Um, Prashant, we've had a couple questions come in about, you know, if we're thinking about going back to um, corn, I believe. And so somebody asked about maybe using is clear, could we use clear field or uh, any tolerant corn? And then someone else asked about using gramoxone next spring. What would the timing be on that gramoxone? Do we need to make sure that it is before planting, um, before emergence, or could we apply gramoxone uh, legally shortly after emergence of these crops? I think I will answer the second question first. Uh, uh, I, I would probably not wait until the corn is V1 to V2 stage, as I can see on, in this question for application of gramoxone. Uh, I would probably do it as a pre-plant uh, application uh, or on the day of, of planting to, to be on the safe side. Yes, there, um, will, will it be uh, getting the growing point killed? Yes, definitely there is a possibility there. Coming to the second question, I think with the EMI, uh, EMI corn, uh, uh, can we go to EMI corn? Yes, we can. It is going to take care of the volunteer corn, most likely. But we got to think like there will be a lot of other weeds that you will be dealing with yeah, in, in that situation. So uh, you have to think about your weed, overall weed management program as well. Uh, can we can we deal with all the, uh, because it will not just be a volunteer corn in that particular field. There will be mesh tail, there will be water hemp, and there will be giant rag wheat and other weeds. So uh, definitely uh, that is going to be a challenge. So. All right, thank you, Prashant. Okay, so we have a ton of questions that have come in. And again, we're going to be, we'll publish this Q&A just so everybody can read it in case you have to jump off. Um, but I think there's a good question about the nutrient management uh, component for Mark, right? So do we have any idea on the rate of release um, for the, the nutrients from this 2020 crop, right? All this, these ears of corn that are on the ground, are the kernels, they said, kind of, are the kernels kind of like slow release capsules? Um, and is there any way for us to capture or hold that nitrogen into, uh, I guess, next year? Yeah, so I was, um, I was just looking at, at that question and, and trying to formulate an answer to type in. Um, so, so great timing, Megan. Um, and I'm sure that we probably should talk to John Sawyer and Antonio to get a little bit more information out um, in this respect. But um, so nitrogen and potassium in the residue, so the stalk and the leaves, uh, will leach out. They will cycle back into the soil fairly quickly. Um, now the nitrogen in the, the grain is in the form of protein, and so that does have to mineralize before it would be available again. Um, and so yes, in that sense, um, grain, uh, grain nitrogen or grain protein um, would act like a, a, slow re a slow release capsule, I guess. Um, now, are there ways to hold, capture and hold that nitrogen to 2022? Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, no, there's probably not a good way of doing that. Um, yes, the soybean crop will utilize it, um, but we also have, well, and we could use cover crops, right? Um, they, they'll take it up and then they'll cycle it back through. Uh, the issue is, is trying to get it, you know, to, to hold on to it and have that available, you know, a, a, basically 18 months from now. Um, and, and we have issues with that largely because, well, I'm presuming we're going to get some rainfall again um, that will start leaching out the system. And we know from 2012 and 2013 that after we have these dry periods like this, um, when we do get back to normal rainfall, we will flush uh, more nit uh, nitrogen out of the system than we normally would. Um, so you know, the thought process of trying to, to save that or capture that nitrogen for 2022 is probably not likely. Um, I presume the, the corn crop or soybean crop, um, hopefully the soybean crop from 2021, uh, will utilize a good portion of that. All right, so we're getting down here. We're over time, but again, uh, as you have questions, we've tried to, to answer them as best possible. So we'll just 
we got a couple more here that I think are good ones that maybe everybody's kind of curious about. So does anyone uh, on here that's presenting not, d does anybody know of any uh, derecho affected corn that has been um, harvested as grain yet? And if so, do we have any idea what the results were with regard to test weight, um, quality yield, et cetera? So Mark, have you heard of any? The, the only thing that I've heard of um, from um, the wind damaged corn was a field. Uh, they were taking it out last Friday and it was coming in at 22% moisture. I asked what the test weight was and did not get a response. So. Okay. All right. Yeah, so, I'll, I'll jump into the, uh, at the farm progress uh, site demo corn got harvested over the weekend and and um, yeah, it was actually fairly decent. You know, it was in the, the low 50s on test weight and uh, uh, mid 20s on moisture. So I think it's going to be very spotty, right? I think there's parts of the field that are that are pretty rough and parts that are that are going to be okay. Good to know. All right. So um, final kind of thoughts or question here uh, as we wrap up. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussion about these different tillage implements, right? And, and ways to manage this residue and, and everybody's probably gonna go about it in a different, uh, a different way. But of course, somebody uh, anonymous has, has asked is, do you have an opinion on what the, the best method might be to prepare the, the field for corn again in 2021, right? So if we were looking at needing to go back to corn, of course, uh, Prashant did a really nice job of addressing the fact that, that we are really gonna have to go make sure that we're choosing a traded corn um, that is uh, going to have a tolerance that the crop from this year did not have. Uh, but do we have any thoughts on what might be the best way to prepare that field, maybe to minimize issues with, with volunteer corn and to manage the residue? out there so that we can get it planted. Mark or Matt, any thoughts? I think Matt doesn't want to, no. Um, <laughs> no. Um, so we know that we, we can plant corn into high residue situations and, and that's really what this would look like. Um, you know, and that, that would not be uncommon. Um, I do think it's going to require that, you know, we are, we do look at processing this, but I think it also requires that we think and we choose high, think about hybrids or choose hybrids that um, do well in a, a high residue corn following corn situation. And so I think, you know, in, in a large part, you know, this process is the same, you know, as if we were before, other than we have the added complexity, you know, of, of a large amount of volunteer corn. Um, but I, I do think that there are hybrids out there that will perform better in a corn following corn situation. Um, and, and we need, just need to find those. Uh, I think we need to be patient. Um, those probably should not be the first fields that get planted next year. Uh, we probably want to hold off on them until the soils are a little bit warmer and drier, um, you know, and we have better conditions for uh, planting to occur. You know, I would just add, you know, I think you want to think about what you're doing now that's going to help you get back to your normal production strategy into 21, right? And people no-till corn on corn all the time, right, across the U.S. And they've got the equipment and they're ready to do that, right? They're prepared in the planner uh, to manage that. They're prepared in their other parts of their production system. So, you know, that's my, my suggestion is keep looking forward, right, and, and, and make decisions that are setting you up for, for success in 21. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Matt, and to the ISU Digital Ag Group for putting together the demonstrations last week. You worked with incredible speed to pull that together so that we could share this information. Um, uh, Brent Pregnitz is our man behind the scenes here that makes all this run and go well. Uh, so thank you, Brent. And I really appreciate everybody for joining us today. And you know, if you have further questions uh, or as you share this with others, things come up, um, please feel free to reach out. We can get you uh, any of our speakers' contact information, hopefully get you the resources that you need 
uh, to be as successful as we can be uh, in dealing with this downed corn. Um, so I hope everybody has a safe and productive fall. Uh, hopefully you get some harvest in, uh, at least with the corn, uh, and uh, we appreciate you joining us today.